If our young men miscarry in their first enterprises, they lose all heart. If the young merchant fails, men say he is ruined. If the finest genius studies at one of our colleges and is not installed in an office within one year afterwards, it seems to his friends and to himself that he is right in being disheartened and in complaining the rest of his life. A sturdy lad from New Hampshire or Vermont who in turn tries all the professions, who teams it, farms it, pedals, is worth a hundred of those city dolls and feels no shame in not studying a profession for he does not postpone his life. He lives already. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am Scott Hambrick. Matt Reynolds is in the bathroom, but he's going to be with us in just a moment. And today's show is going to be about uh, perfectionism in our community and how to be kind to yourself. Um, So many of us, frankly, nerd out and freak out about form and programming and everything that we do here, uh, probably to our detriment oftentimes. And we wanted to talk a little bit today about, you know, where that comes from and what good it may do us and what harms it, it likely does us. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. Um, and I sent an essay to Reynolds, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk about it on the show if we had a chance. It's one that has been a big influence on me. It's Ralph Waldo Emerson's Self-Reliance. And I thought I'd read just a few lines from it before we get into this. You were trying to talk about being kind yes. to each other. Instead, you're going to read Emerson. No he's, no, he's talking about being kind to, kind to yourself. He says, a man, like Emerson thought that people had this inner genius that conformity stamped down and maybe didn't stamp down, but drowned out. So people weren't able to tap into this inner genius. Not that he thought that everyone was a genius, but they all had some inner aptitude or some inner, inner voice or intuition that could be their guide. He says, a man should learn to detect and watch that gleam of light, which flashes across his mind from within more than the luster of the firmament of bards and sages. Like listen to yourself. He's like, he's distinctly American, this guy, and uh, just love it. He says, there's a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion. This is the perfectionism part, right? You have to take yourself for better or worse as your portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him, but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground, which is given him to till. So good. So good. Self-reliance, man. Got to go, got, got to go read this. He, um, this is a, uh, he's been a huge influence on me, man. He says, uh, insist on yourself. Never imitate. Shakespeare will never be made by the study of Shakespeare. Do that which is assigned you, and you cannot hope too much or dare too much. Mm. Do your work. So, okay, this is the last piece I'm going to read. He talks about he talks about young men and striving and and um, conforming. And he says, if our young men miscarry in their first enterprises, they lose all heart. If the young merchant fails, men say he is ruined. If the finest genius studies at one of our colleges and is not installed in an office within one year afterwards in the cities or suburbs of Boston or New York, it seems to his friends and to himself that he is right in being disheartened and in complaining the rest of his life. A sturdy lad from New Hampshire or Vermont who in turn tries all the professions, who teams it, farms it, pedals, keeps a school, preaches, edits a newspaper, goes to Congress, buys a township, and so forth in successive years, and always, like a cat falls on his feet, is worth a hundred of those city dolls. He walks abreast with his days and feels no shame in not studying a profession, for he does not postpone his life. He lives already. He has not one chance, but a hundred chances. Ah, so, so good. So fucking good. That is good. Yeah, you know, tap into that inner genius. Don't let other people uh, evaluate that for you. And live your lot and do your portion and till, till your acreage. That's all you can do. Yep. Yeah. So how does that apply to this perfectionism thing? You know, everybody's like, i going to get a form check, you know. And a lot of people that come to me, their form really needs work. Um, 
they're not getting all the mechanical good they can out of their bodies, you know? So a lot of times their LP is stalled. If a man, man's LP, for example, might be stalled with a 205 squat and fixing his form lets him tap into muscle mass. He wasn't using all, and it goes, it just takes off, you know, but there's a point where it's just not getting any better. My squat's never going to get any better than it is. Right. It's never mm-hmm. going to get any better. So what do yeah. I do with that? What do I do with that? Well, it can't look like someone who's built to squat perfectly. It can't it can't look like Kirk Karwaski. So if if perfection is Kirk Karwaski, it's impossible for you to even achieve it. I'm not sure I can even squat according to the model right. consistently. Sure. Sure. Well, the question is what are we working for? Right? Like our I think that I think the goal becomes a big part of this deal. If the goal is perfection, and it certainly we want to be as as close to perfection as we can achieve, that's fine. But isn't the real refining piece of this is actually the process of it all, right? It's the process of the work. It's the work in and of itself. It's not the achievement of perfection because the achievement of perfection is never going to come. Emerson just told us no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him, but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground, which is given him to till. Yeah. It's, it's, it, I it got reminds, bad soil. <laughs> it's <laughs> the squat I do. It, it, what are you going to do? It, 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 yeah. It reminds me of Solomon. It's funny. It reminds me of King Solomon in both like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs where he's like, you know, the, the version that everybody hears in the, in the Bible is like vanity of vanities, mm. right? Like all is vanity. And that, that word is actually more like smoke. It's like this thing that cannot be grasped. It's like this thing you can see but cannot grasp it. And when you go in and look at what he's, he's like, I've tried it all. I've thrown all the parties. I've had all the wives. I've had the crazy sex. I've had all the farms. I've had all, and nothing satisfied. Like mm-hmm. satisfaction was like smoke that I could not grasp. And he's like, these are the things that are satisfying in life. And like the one is the, is the fruit of your own labor, he calls it. Mm-hmm. The fruit of your own labor, right? And then it's Solomon and it's the Bible. So he talks about the fear of the Lord as well. But like, that's it. Like he, like here's the guy that had more money than anybody who's ever lived and done everything and partied and tried to fill that hole with everything. And the thing that was the most satisfying to him was the fruits of his own labor, like the, the working of the ground by his own hands. Like that's, and so that's the thing. That's what we're doing, right? In the, in the gym. I think so. It's the doing. It's uh, it's the doing. I do think there's a meditate. I've said this before. I've, I kind of wanted to do a show on it. But um, there, there is a meditative aspect, a contemplative aspect to doing these motions over and over and over again. It's like yoga, you know. Yeah. You, you, you know that seeking that perfection, or more maybe more like tai chi, where you continually right. are trying to just seek the perfection in this movement, and you have to be present. Uh, you have to uh, focus on on something other than yourself. Really, you can you, you have to be when the squat is heavy. You have to be completely present to it. You're not thinking about yes. the news. You're not thinking about the no. weather or picking up milk on the way home. You if have you are, to be completely, trouble. completely tuned into that thing for that time. So, you know, that, that seeking that perfection, I think is good. But the part where it becomes cancerous is when you demand it. Yeah, why haven't yourself I reached and it yet? Beat yourself why haven't up. I reached perfection? Right. It's that. Yeah. Why do I see this other person who, Four months in, they're squatting 375 for three sets of five, and I'm only squatting 220 for three sets of five or 175 for like whatever, right? It's that you're comparing yourself to other people. It's that's there's no worth in that, right? That this is the and you, you and I have talked about this a lot, and sometimes you give me a hard time about this. You talk about it, it's like my my Protestant work ethic thing. But like I think there's value in the work itself, and I think you agree with that as much as you like to like give me a hard time. But it's the process of the work that brings the joy. I, I agree. I agree mostly. Okay. And, you know, uh, my favorite movie is Cool Hand Luke. Yep. And he's like, well, Luke, what's your dirt doing in my ditch? You know, and he's just digging a hole. Yep. Right. And then he digs the hole, and he's like, Luke, what's your dirt doing in my yard? And he puts the yep. whole dirt right. Sure. No. Like some of it's just bullshit. Sure. Um, but but no, it, it, it can be good. You know, it's your lot to till and and then that's good. But um, the, the the problem becomes the problem becomes when you're 
you just seek that perfection and you demand it and then you beat yourself up when you don't get it. And sure. then when there's the comparison to the other people, I think that's when it becomes nasty and uh, detrimental to people. Like if I actually demand, if I actually judged myself <laughs> based on my squad, I would have quit this a long time ago. Sure. Well, if you judge yourself based on your squad, especially compared to other people's squats. Yeah. If the standard is not, like your squad has actually gotten a lot better over the last several years compared yeah. to itself, and it's never going to get better than it was yesterday. It's not right, but <laughs> it's not. But you com- but you compare it to someone who is Ed Cohn or something. You are like that's not, or, or, or just or really just normal people. I am forty four yeah, years old. The bell curve, yeah. And, and I squatted, um, I squatted what I squat. I squatted three ninety for a triple the other day. Just awful. Look like shit. Sure. You know, no. Everybody had to look away. <laughs> you know what I was doing. It. Right. What are you going to do? It was great for you. <laughs> well, and if and if Joseph Pena, if he compares himself to the middle of the bell curve, he's selling himself short. Right. It's That's just, why we, we don't compare ourselves to other people at all. We just do the work and make sure it's right. And the only comparison we have is we've got these sort of metrics that say, well, we know in general that three sets of five across multiple times per week, adding a little weight each time, works for pretty much everybody. We know that eating enough calories works for pretty much everybody. Like we do want to get away from, you got to be careful about getting falling into special snowflake territory there. It's not that you are such a special snowflake that the same style of work that works for everybody else won't work for you. It will work for you, but you're not going to achieve perfection out of it. And if perfection is the goal and you beat yourself up for not achieving perfection, I have to say this a lot. I, I try to, I actually repeat it often to my clients, I remind them what they're paying me for in online coaching and and, and and in person. You're paying me to nitpick the form. Right. My job is to complain. That's right. That's I'm you know, and so and, and occasionally it's really, really, really good and there is no complaint. I'm just like, man, that's deadlift looks great. Nothing to change. Yeah. You know, onward and upward. But um but most of the time you're nitpicking little tiny things. And in the beginning you're you're talking about big picture stuff. Like, oh this you got no hip drive at all. Right. And then later you're like, ah, there's just a little bit, like a half inch bar sway down there in the bottom. Right. Right. Well, that's not the same thing that you had six months ago. And so there's progress. So and for you, your form is probably as good as it's ever going to get. And so the only progress that you're going to, that you can really make is putting weight on the bar. Yeah. Is getting a little stronger, getting a little heavier. You know, right. right. By and the then way, the day is going to come when it's going to be progress is how slow you can take weight off the bar. Yeah. With your super shitty form. I I think I I would like to be there. <laughs> yeah, you're ready to. Yeah, I'm ready to. You're get ready up to be in my world and start taking weight off the bar, huh? Uh, bought the new. By the way, got the new Rogue Classic Do Wins. Got them in. You did the suede ones with the stack leather yep. heel. Yep. You, yep. They used to sell them. Quit making them. Yep. Then they started making them again. Uh, taller heel than my old shoe. It's almost a full inch. Huh. Such a big help for me. Oh yeah, because your knees are such your a legs big are so help. long anyway. It's big, big help. Um, Interesting. Mine are a size eleven. Charities are, I don't know. Their charities are charity size. You know, much, much smaller. Right. Her heel is not as tall as mine. So if you get one, if you buy those, it's the size leather. of shoe depends. The okay. Yeah, I'm an eleven. Are you? Are you one of those? If I have a nice, clean pair of socks on, can I try your shoes? Yeah. Here in a couple of days when I'm at your house, yeah. And I'll just do some body weight squats and see what it feels like. Yeah, I mean, I that really like that hot, tall, taller heel. It's been a big help to me. Um, but I have these people that who um, you know seek that perf- seek that perfection. Uh, I think to the detriment of the self. You know, you know, worry about that. And I don't know how to, I don't know how as a coach, how to walk that razor's edge, but between giving them permission to not be perfect, but not letting things slide as well. Right. So it's really, it's really, really difficult for me to do that. And then it's also difficult for people to do that inside their own head. You know, like what's good enough what's me being too demanding, what's not good enough. That's really, really difficult to find you know within your own skull so a coach is helpful there but then the coach has to be kind of tuned in and sensitive as well like for guess for some of my clients the thing they need to learn isn't right improving the form two percent some of it's just doing the work non-judgmentally some sometimes that's the thing that needs to be learned and that man that's that's tough 
like a, it's well, the personality of the person plays such a major role there. And we did that episode on, are you a person who is a, enjoys right. the process of training or are you, do you, do you do training? Like it's take it like it's medicine. Right. And, and for me, when I enjoy training, like I enjoy the process, enjoy the work. I, I like, I actually get joy out of it. I complete the session and I'm, and I'm, I have joy from that. I can remember when I was chasing numbers big time as a competitive lifter, I was really chasing numbers that you would get into a point where it was no longer enjoyable. So for a person who either takes their training like medicine, I think that's one of the harder, the harder places, right? So a guy like you who just takes his training like medicine can accept that it's not going to be perfect, but that the but that the benefit of the training is going to be worth it. And a person like me who really enjoys to train, and as I get older, I've actually gotten less OCD about my training, about like making sure everything was exactly in the right spot. I can have joy in it, but it's interesting to think of a really a person on either side of that spectrum, whether they enjoy it or take it as medicine, but who are overly judgmental on themselves based on their performance, their technique, the weight they lift, et cetera. How often does the training rob them of joy rather than I mean, give them joy? I think it happens often, and and uh, I hate to see that. A lot too. Um, I think that I think that the motivation there might be, you know, we talk about exercise bulimia. It might be the same kind of a motivation. You know, it's it's just it's a realm in which they can exert yeah. control. Maybe lots of areas of their lives are out of control, so they seek that here. You know, in the gym. In the, yes. in the strength lab, um, and uh, you know maybe maybe that is healthy, maybe that is sure. part of the you know okay life is really stressful you know a lot of people they, I can go in the gym you know maybe for that time you know the, the world is a safe place yeah and you can exert control over your training and and maybe that's what you need when everything's yep. you know when you're driving on ice the other twenty two hours a day of your life. Um, but I just, I just hope everybody can kind of take a step back and see yeah. what they're doing, what their motivations are and what they're doing to themselves and for themselves and, and you know, demand in the excellence. Yeah, I think the way you started to sort of communicate that, it felt like this idea of your life being out of control was going to be a negative thing. But we've all lived enough life to know that there are in everybody's life, there are times when the majority of your life is out of your control, Right. You just can't, like, Professor Paul has cancer. That's out of his control. What are you going to do, right? Uh, tragedy hits. You get in a car accident. Those things are out of your control. You just, that just is what it is. And so you seek control in places that you can have it. And so those people tend to do really well with stuff like macro-based nutrition and stuff that they can control. But then the problem is they go in and they often think that they can control every aspect of their workout. And sometimes, and so then their joy is often dependent upon how well they performed the workout. Did they hit the reps? Was the technique great? Did they did they do it without pain? Things like that. And and if not, then all of a sudden you end up with this like, ugh, that I, I that was a that was a worthless workout. I didn't get anything out of it. And so and again, that's the, the idea there is it's the, it's all about the long term process. We're always talking about the long term athletic de- development model of our lifter. And the idea is that we just keep being consistent and we keep doing the work and the work refines us. And we do better every day with yep. the, we try to do better every day with the technique. And some days the technique actually gets better and sometimes it doesn't. We try to put weight on the bar every single time or nearly every single time or however long our macro cycle is. And most of the time we're able to do that. And sometimes we're not. Um, but that's, that's why the end goal for me uh, or the refining process of this, I think, is less about hitting PRs. PRs give us the metric that tells us that we're moving the right direction. But the end goal for me is not necessarily PRs. It's actually the or yeah. the end goal is PRs. The refining process right. occurs from the work itself. I think that's maybe a better way to say it. PRs don't refine me and make me better. The work it took to reach the PR refined me right. and made me better. That's the difference. And some sometimes, and, and I'm I think I'm here right now. Uh, my training goal is just to train three times a week. Yep. It's consistency only. And if it's shitty, I I, I mean, I don't even care. 
Uh, I'm super busy. There, yeah. I, I, there are so many things that I want to do that I can't possibly do them all. I mean, I'm feeling my mortality. Yeah. There's just no way I'm ever going to do all the things that I want to do. And, um, yeah, training is in the way of that. But I weigh everything out that, that I want to do, and it's still race, sure. right? I still – it's still going to be. It's still on the slate. It's still on the agenda, but you know, three times a week, all I'm going to give it, and so I'm going to try to get what I can of that three days a week and move on with my with my days, and that's as best I can do, man. There are a lot of people that are like, oh, that didn't go well, and they know that they're on a certain kind of program that yeah. should yeah, result, okay. let's say, in um, monthly PRs, and when that when they monthly PR doesn't happen. They're dejected. You know, it's like 12 weeks wasted, you know, and you have a little baby fit, <laughs> throw your belt. Um, you know, I get it. But, you know, what right. are you going to do? You can't get the 12 I've, weeks I've back. There. When you're real competitive, you're there. I mean, that's part of the deal. What are you going to do? It's over. Right. It's behind you. There's no choice but to accept it. And, uh, you know, I think that you can evaluate it. You should look at it and say, you know, how, what could have gone better what actually happened, and then you know maybe try to learn from that. But you, you yeah. have to accept it. it. It is reality. Once it occurs, it's reality, and you have to accept it. Right. Well, by the way, that's it. Doesn't always. It doesn't mean that the thing that happened was bad. It's, it's part of the their same. Out, you have to have the same outlook, even if it's great. Right. So we, we a perfect little microcosm of this is what happens at a meet with my clients when we're you you and I have coached a lot of meets together at this point, right? Person comes out, if they miss their squat or they hit their squat, that rep is behind them. We don't think about that rep anymore. Tomorrow, <laughs> next week, that day. we'll talk about what went right, what went wrong. If if something went wrong and you have another attempt left, I'm gonna just focus on the form correction. Right, so I'm not going to be like, we're not going to get mad and stomp our feet and throw a fit because we missed it, and we're not going to be overly celebratory when we hit the thing, especially if there's more to come. Right, or maybe another squat and two more lifts. Right, and so we focus on the thing we have. So it's very important that, and people will do that. Like maybe they have a bad day in the squat at a meet, and they let it throw off their press and their deadlift because they can't stop thinking about the squat. Or maybe they hit a big PR in the squat, like a right. huge PR. As a matter of fact, this has happened several times in powerlifting where someone broke a world record in the squat, and then they and then they literally miss all three attempts on their bench press and bomb out, and the world record no longer counts because they bombed out. Like because they right. were so the focused on the thing they had just accomplished, they screwed up in the present. Right, and this is all about being in the present. So we're in the present, and so. If, if you had a bad day, if you had a good day, you just chalk it up to a bad day or a good day. This is one of the things that back when I played cards, uh, which is a time in my life I'm not very proud of, but when I played poker, everybody that plays poker always has these stories about these hands that they, these amazing hands they won or lost. And nobody cares about your hand, right? It was interesting for being a guy like me who is a, who is a, likes to tell stories and uh, occasionally likes to exaggerate just a tad. I never had card stories because I never remembered what card I, cards I had the second I folded the cards. So I would fold cards and potentially maybe I hit a, a full house at, by the end. But I would often not even know if I did because as soon as I folded the cards, my brain turned off that what I even had. I didn't even remember what I had at that point. I'm watching the way the rest of those guys are playing or whatever, but like that's a big part of that deal. It's like you come into the gym, you do your work, you do want to analyze what you did right and wrong, but then you don't want to let it affect your day like truly positively or truly negatively in a sort of a, a fleeting happiness sort of sense, but that there was joy that I did the work itself. And that joy that that work is gonna add up with other work and is gonna is gonna make me a better person, make me a stronger person. All these things are very important. But yeah, man, you you look you, you miss the forest through the trees often when you just focus on the well. I didn't. I missed a rep on my deadlift, or you know, I I missed. It's yeah, over. It's it. It the, the the past training is a sunk cost. Like you can't get That's it right. back. It's spent and it's gone. Uh, I bought tickets to go see Dwight Yoakam a few years ago. I've actually done this two or three times, and I, I love Dwight Yoakam. Amazing. And I had a I had a terrible day at work, and it was snowing. 
and Dwight Yoakam's show kicked off at 8 p.m. I was like, I don't fucking want to go. Sure. It didn't go. Didn't sell the tickets. Right. Just went to bed. The money was spent. Right. And I love Dwight Yoakam. We've done done that. But the money was spent. It was already gone. So I I couldn't grieve it. I mean, I just where it was where I was in that evening and not going to beat myself up about it. And I didn't even want to go to the trouble to even give the ticket away. (laughs) Right. No, I mean, then you get a call. Hey, man, you know, oh, I'll meet you up. It's like, no, I just wanted to go to yep. bed. And Charity and I went to bed. And if we hadn't done that, we'd have been out the money, out the sleep, and then the next morning we'd have been more miserable sure, than we had right. been, even though I love Dwight that's Yoakam. Right. And there are times when there are things I like that I would go ahead and sacrifice for. Yeah. Sacrifice for. But in that time, I was like, this is a sunk cost. I can't get it back. I'm not going to beat myself up about it. I'm not going to make myself do something I don't want to do because I've got a sunk cost. I'm moving on. Yeah. Man, my training's like that more and more every day. Yep. That's all right, though. I mean, that doesn't, it sounds, you know, it's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing, right? And I think to realize we're, we're real careful not to be compared too much ourselves to other people, but the reality is, is that way, way, way less than 1% of the people on earth are doing the things we're doing in the weight room. And I'm not talking about the weights we're lifting. I'm talking about just doing it. Just doing it. Almost nobody, like in your city, you got a city of a million people. How many people are actually going to the gym and truly working, truly training in that city of a million people? 150? Maybe. I mean, holy shit. Maybe. I'm not that strong. There probably aren't more than 10 guys in the city that could squat more right. than me. I don't I mean, know. I mean, isn't that bizarre? And so you just... Maybe. And it's not even about... Again, know. it's not even about how strong you are. It's just about like even, you know, people like your your like your like mom, if, if she trains, like Todd, right. your your father-in-law. Like how many... How old's Todd? 54. How many 54-year-old guys are coming in three days a week or... Three days, is that what he's doing? Three days a week? He's, he's on four-day split now. Four-day split. So coming in doing four days and just training their balls off four days a week at 54 years old. Yeah. But not just in Tulsa, but what about in the whole world? So, like, not even talking about his numbers, his how health, no quantifiable metrics at all. How many guys are going to work to do that thing to become better? Nobody works harder than Todd, man. I'm telling you. Dude, and, and it's just so, you know, Sybil, like, it, it doesn't matter what the guys, it doesn't fucking matter what the weight is. It's the process. Todd. Todd's right. been a little bit hard on himself. He had he had an abscess tooth in I think Oof. May. Ouch. I don't know. I can't remember what it was. Earlier this year, abscess right. tooth bad. Like sure. had to have some oral surgery. Yeah. Seventy years ago, I, I'm a hundred percent sure it would have killed him. Right. Like pre worked up into his brain and killed. Yeah, dead right. man. I had an abscess once too. I know you know this, but it wasn't in my tooth. Right. You got it from someone's tooth. <laughs> uh, he and he had a he had a little accident. And uh, hurt his hurt his leg, and ended up getting like a, a hematoma, like a you know big bloody mess, and under the hide there on his leg. And you know he's been he's been out, he's been down, and um, had to had to kind of do some LP again. He his LP ended higher than it had. Yep. Um, then we moved him to do some week long programming. It ended ended higher than his bi weekly programming had ended. Yep, and uh, come Saturday he's going to start biweekly programming again. Yep. And split. you know he's he's been a little frustrated trying to get back to where he was before his injuries, right? And, uh, but you're comparing programming to programming. You're like, but look, last time you got through, you finished LP, you finished it here, and this time you finished LP, and you're fifteen percent higher, ten percent higher, whatever it is. That's right. And then you go to, and then yep, yeah, that's the process, man. Hey, Todd, I pulled my last deadlift PR. <laughs> I don't know, you know, about seven years ago. And I've yep. continued to mostly train over the last seven years and haven't hit a PR. And so it may never hit another PR. And so hope I do. Todd, uh, Todd's got some coming. He's got them coming. But I, I get it. It's hard, man. But but you compare yourself. You know, like if I miss a bunch of training and I come back and train and I do LP, like I compare to my last LP. Yeah. Not to the greatest I've ever been. Not to when I was a professional strongman. It's not that kind of stuff. Uh, you can't. And so for these guys that have trained their whole lives, as they run into life problems in their middle and older ages, and they can't come back and hit all-time PRs, you, you, well, you better find some reasons for doing this thing. 
And I know I know why Todd's. I mean, I'm sure Todd's doing it for quality of life. Like his quality of life is better. I assume yeah, he's, he's addicted to though. Well, that's good. Nothing wrong yeah. with that, right? But if everything is about the micro, is about the day, is about the lift, yeah, is about that rep, and that one goes bad and it ruins the rest of the workout or the rest of the week or even the rest of the cycle, and that's that's no good. Or even the rest of your night, right? Like that's not. We don't want it to refer. So the point of this podcast is to be kind to yourself. We're doing something that most people won't do. Yep. And, and by the way, that said, it ain't that hard, right? We're not storming Omaha Beach right now. No, no. But it is something that we can do that most people don't, that we can take some pride in, that we don't lord over other people, we don't shove it in their face. And we, because we do it for me, we don't do it for them, right? And we enjoy the work and we enjoy the process. And that involves being kind to ourselves when we struggle through it, right? I, it's the same thing with like my, my daughter when, when she struggles with math and she gets real mad at herself. I'm like, hey, like you, you realize this is what learning is. It's like your knowledge is like here. Your knowledge is like at a five. And we're doing math at a six and a half level. And you're not at a six and a half. But doing math at six and a half and working through the hard things will bring your knowledge level up to a six and a half. And then guess what happens to the math? Now we're doing it at a seven and a half harder. or an eight. Like that's it just gets harder. That's the idea. And if you're frustrated every time you like, right? Like at anything that comes easy is worthless. This is hard, requires hard work, and that often the work itself is the thing that we find the joy in, not necessarily in the payoff from the work. Ugh. And it's hard for me to find the joy sometimes, Matt. Matt yeah, me Reynolds. Too. Me too. I don't know. I like train. I like training. I just don't like getting ready to train. You don't like getting ready to train? Yeah, like almost every day. I'm like, ugh, can I gotta go train. I don't want to. It's pretty rare that I want to. If I'm training at like your house or training with Brett, we've got a group we're training with or whatever, then I'm I get wait I I get excited at night. You know, like I I have a hard time sleeping. I'm like, oh, I get to go train with all my friends tomorrow. Then I'm it's exciting. But on those days where you're punching that time clock, you're training in your by yourself in that bedroom or that garage. You're like, don't want to do this. Yeah. But but I'm not a medicine taker. Once I get in there and start training, I'm like, all right, all right. I'm feeling better, right? And it is meditative for me. It's meditative, yep. right? It really call, it takes lots of focus. You really got to hone in on the present. Yep. Yeah, I got a five rep squat PR earlier this week. So well, it's still going. It's what was still it? still going. I got Three, 370 for five. 370. That's pretty good. Pretty dang good. For me. Yeah. You know. I've got guys that blow past it, you know, and they'll pee and, you know, what am I going to do? Sure. My That's deadlift's good. heavier than theirs. <laughs> and so is my press. <laughs> but, you know, what am I going to do? I, but, man, it, my, God, I, I had it scheduled. I had that five at 370 scheduled and, and on my book for two weeks. So I knew I knew it was that coming. Uh, Tuesday that I was going to be doing that. And I was worried about it the whole time because I knew – I knew that I probably had about a 30% chance of getting it for four. Man, it's easier to hit it for five than to do four and fail on the fifth one. Sure. I would rather lock out five than get halfway up on the fifth one and set it down. God damn, that's hard. I mean, it's physically very, very difficult to miss one. Sure. And then, um, you know, then, then the mentally taxing portion of it. And the thing was just renting space in my head, you know, for the last four or five days. But I had to I had to go ahead knowing that there's like I said, about a one third chance that I wasn't gonna hit that. Right. That's not great. What were you thinking That's, when you were actually squatting it? Can you remember? Oh. No. Well, I mean I mean I'm not thinking anything when I'm squatting it except, you know, getting Get under the bar, with. making sure it's in the right spot on my head. Sure. On my head, back, on my back. back. And then uh and then just keeping my hips back. Not letting my knee go forward, not getting not getting on my toes. That's the only yep. thing I can think about. And then also not crapping my pants. I hate that stuff so much. You actually the trough. think about not crapping your pants? Oh, I don't. Yes, I hate it. Oh, I never think about that. I've shit myself. Well, you times. just love it. There's a part of you that loves it. Doesn't that. bother me. I have stories that I cannot tell. You you, you just love it though. No, I don't love it's it. A, I don't want to shit my pants. I think, that, I think for you, it's a. I think it's another, a second kind of release for you when you <laughs> fill the trough. But I just fucking hate that. And I did get a nosebleed, and I hate that too. Gracious, I hate it. 
Yeah, I've never had. Dude, there's so much moment on my back when my bottom rib is touching my thigh at the bottom. I mean, it's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's brutal. You know, but I I had to know, like, I'm going to go do this, and it's going to be what it's going to be. And if I get four, or if I get three, or if I get six, it none of it matters. None of it matters. And I wasn't going to beat myself up about it, you know. Right. Luckily, I got five. They're ugly. I didn't even film it because I don't even want to see it. Like, had you not gone into the gym at all and not done it at all? Then, then, then you lose something. Yeah. Then something was lost. There's a uh, another art of manliness episode. He hate he did one with Teddy Atlas, the famous boxing trainer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to go look up the episode number. And, and and Teddy was talking about you know people people get people are scared to go in the ring. Episode five twenty four. People are scared to get in the ring, or they're scared of whatever the heck it is. And he said, you know, most things only last a minute or two. The yep. scary thing only yep. lasts a minute or two. And he said he's much more scared of living with never doing it. Sure. Because the, the scary the thing lasts a minute or two, right. but the, the regret, regret lasts, lasts forever. For life. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a healthy way to look at it. Yeah, that's why I meant. Man, that's a great show. Yeah. Brett always does a, gr- a good show, but the Teddy Atlas show and the Richard Rohr show here in the last couple of weeks have been just, just crushed them. Completely different level of stuff. Yeah. Well. Awesome. There's another Barbell Logic episode. I hope you guys can quit focusing so much on that perfection and uh, focus on the fact that you do things that other people don't do and that you're better than you were. You're stronger than you were. And that's because that is the point. The point isn't this rep or even this session. The point is that you're better than you were. Uh, And so if you don't meet your own expectation, it's okay, man. You'll be back. Come back next time. Come back next time. Make the notes in your book. Figure out what went wrong. Be objective about it. Keep some distance from it and just come back again. Uh, Don't look at the other guy at the gym, by the way. That's right. Don't look at him. You got to till your lot. Till your lot. That's good. Anything else, Uncle Matt? No, man. Till your lot. I don't don't know that it gets better than that. That's what you do. Yeah. And uh, go get, uh, go get, Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, Self Reliance. It's like 19 pages. The first two or three pages of it are tough. They're tough. It's like a, almost like a mystical, transcendental, like word salad. But when you get past that, you start to see like a unique American religion, I think, actually. Yeah. And uh, really, really interesting. It's a big deal to me in, in my whole life. Well, there you go. Send your questions to questions at barbell-logic.com. And uh, maybe, I don't know, if you got a story about uh, about you being hard on yourself and overcoming that or uh, how you deal with that, send us that. I would be interested to hear what you guys have to say about such things. Okay. Also, uh, go to Google Play or Stitcher or Overcast, or your other favorite uh, pod catcher, and uh, give us a review or star us as one of your favorites because that all helps us get the word out. Nobody's squat is worse than mine. Nobody's squat's worse than mine. That is true. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you in a few days.